Hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program, looking at results from a new Iraqi opinion poll conducted by Al Mustaqilla, the Independent Institute of Administration and Civil Society Studies with the BBC and ORB International. Uh, joining us to discuss the poll and its findings are first um, Dr. Munkis Dagir, the Chief Executive Officer and Founder of Al Mustaqilla, the Independent Institute of Administration and Civil Society Studies Research Group in Iraq, and a Gallup International Board member. Uh, he uh, conducted Iraq's first ever opinion, public opinion poll in 2003. Uh, he's also a professor of public administration and strategic management in Baghdad and Basra and at the National Defense University. Uh, I'm also delighted to welcome uh, Johnny Held, uh, the chief executive officer of ORB International, uh, which he joined in 1998. He has worked in research since 1992 and specializes in issue-based campaign, international and sociopolitical research. He has almost two decades of uh, experience conducting multi-country research in developing markets, and he has spearheaded ORB's work in the Middle East and Africa, uh, running hundreds of studies for a variety of public and private sector agencies. Moderating the session today is Ambassador Douglas Silliman, President of AGSIW. He previously served as U.S. Ambassador to Iraq from 2016 to 2019 and U.S. Ambassador to Kuwait from 2014 to 2016. Among his uh, numerous other postings, he also served as a Senior Advisor in the Bureau of Near Eastern Affairs and the U.S. Department of State working on Iraq issues and the U.S. Africa Leaders Summit. Uh, and with that, Ambassador Silliman, over to you. Raymond, thank you very much for that introduction, and thanks to all of you in the audience for joining us today. Uh, again, I'm Doug Sullivan, president of the Arab Gulf States Institute, and I'm really very excited about today's program. We have got uh, two of the experts in the world on polling in the Middle East, and particularly in Iraq. And I know that as the American ambassador in Baghdad, I was always trying to figure out what Iraqis thought about what was going on, certainly what Iraqis thought about the United States and our policy, but also what they thought about their country, the imposition of democracy in a new constitution, the functioning of their government, and what they thought about other countries in the region and how they interacted with them. Uh, we've got two very strong experts and two very good analyses to present to you this morning. And since we only have 60 minutes, I want to get out of the way and let uh, Dr. Munkath and Mr. Held uh, present their uh, uh, their ideas and the results of the polling, and then get into questions. So Dr. Munkith, if I can ask you to start by uh, giving us some of the results of the polling that you and uh, Johnny conducted. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I'm so glad to be with you today, and hopefully we will uh, have a fruitful session here. So uh, uh, is the screen share? Is Working? Yes, okay. So, uh, on 2003, I was in Baghdad when the invasion took place uh, in, in Iraq. And at that time, the, I noticed that there was a big uh, uh, split between uh, people uh, toward that invasion. Some people were happy, many people are uh, were not happy. So I decided to run the first poll in, in, in Iraq history. And at that time, the there were two different point of views between Iraqis. There were that view that who welcome the fall of the past regime, and there was the view and uh, of course with a lot of hopes and expectations about the future and there was that uh, uh, picture the, the, that black picture about the uh, the invasion and what will happen after that so after 20 years i thought that it might be a good uh, opportunity to revisit the Iraqi opinions toward uh, the the invasion. What I will present uh, today is the result of 
uh, a poll that we conducted as Al Mustaqilla group uh, um, in, uh, in Iraq during, yeah, during uh, last month after 20 years. And it was based on a nationwide face-to-face -face interviews uh, around 2,100 uh, interviews with a margin of error plus minus 4.2. And the, the sample was a probability random sample uh, with uh, a very uh, good methodology that can reflect the real public opinion of Iraqis uh, everywhere. Now, uh, some of these questions that I will present here, uh, I will compare it with Iraqi's views on 2003, so we can trace the, the change in the, uh, in the views of Iraqis and in the perceptions of Iraqis towards the invasions. And some are uh, new questions that we asked about the last 20 years among Iraqis. Of course, as a company who are doing uh, almost uh, four to six nationwide polls every month since 2003, uh, we have a very rich data about uh, Iraqi perceptions, but here we will focus more on how Iraqis perceive the invasion right now after all these years. So the first question is, what was the main reason for US government to uh, invade Iraq on 2003? And uh, as you can see here, those who think that uh, Iraqis, uh, sorry, uh, US invaded Iraq to bring democracy, only 29%, all other Percentages refer to uh, different reasons with the interest of the US government, not the Iraqi interest. So to fight terrorism and uh, bring uh, democracy, uh, if we aggregate both is 35%, while the vast majority, they think that it's to achieve the US economic interests or to overthrow the old uh, regime. So that means that uh, Iraqis views toward the invasion uh, for the reason for the invasion is negative in, in general. How would you say Iraq is today compared to how it was before 2003? Would you say it has improved or worsened? As you can see, those who say that it's improved, 58%, 41%, it's worsened. And uh, it's remarkable to, to, to see that the age differences the, the perceptions of different ages are uh, almost similar. And uh, for the analysis sake, we classified Iraqis to those who are less than 35 years old, because those who are less than 35 years old, they didn't uh, live under Saddam regime, or at least they were not aware about Saddam regime uh, when uh, the invasion took place. So we wanted to, uh, to, to, to compare between those who lived under Saddam regime, who are more than 35 years or above 35 years old and less. So as you can see here, uh, the, the differences between the two groups, the older group and the young group, is almost similar uh, toward the uh, the life under Saddam, uh, or whether the life has improved or worsened. As you can see here, 
uh, those uh, under 35 years old, 58% uh, say that it's worsened. How would you say Iraq is today as compared to how it was before as again? And if some people, and this is very remarkable also uh, think, because at the beginning of the invasion, it looks like that Shias and Kurds uh, were more satisfied with the invasion than Sunnis. This was the general perception uh, in, in general. But as you can see here, now those, the, the Sunnis, of course, those who say that uh, it's worsen or uh, are much higher among Sunnis, 68% saying that it's worsen, but also majority of Shias saying that it's worsen uh, uh, in comparison with those who say improved. It's only among Kurds, 60% uh, uh, say that it's improved, uh, yet there is 37%, which is a big chunk of Kurds who still say that things uh, didn't improve. And uh, please don't uh, uh, jump to a conclusion that uh, this means that people or uh, the uh, Iraqis right now prefer Ira uh, Saddam regime. Uh, let us wait for the uh, next slides to, to have a better idea about uh, Iraqis' perceptions. As you can see, this is a different question, but in the same direction. Thinking about your life now, do you judge it to be better off because the US came to Iraq or worse off? As you can see, those who say that it is worse off, almost 50%. And if you aggregate this with those who say that it's no different, 92%. So you will end up with less than one quarter of Iraqis, less than one quarter of Iraqis that they say that it's better off. And this include Sunnis, Shias, and Kurds, and all age groups. As you can see it here, you, among, among Kurds, the, the story is different. Uh, as you can see, better off among Kurds is 62, but among Shias and Sunnis, both are very close. I mean, 14% better off among Shia, 19% better off among Sunnis, while worse off among Shia is remarkable. It's even, it's even higher than Sunni, even higher than Sunni. 54% for Shia who say worse off uh, in comparison to 45 or versus 45% among Sunnis worsen off and you have 20% or 20% among Kurds who say that it's worse off. And uh, that is a, a, a remarkable uh, number. And if we, if we compare this with, for instance, 2005, where we first asked this question, as you can see, the red pie here, on 2005, 67% of Iraqis say that we are better under the current system. This is a shrink or this is declined to only 31% right now. So you can see a huge decline on those who say that it's better under uh, their life is better under current regime. While those who say that it was better under the previous regime jumped from 17% to 36%.
So right now, uh, the this can summarize the the significant change in Iraqis' opinions toward the current and the, uh, the to the current regime. Again, this does not mean that Iraqis are happy with previous regime because, uh, uh, as you will see, it uh, uh, among under 50, uh, 35 years old, the blue one, as you can see it, it's uh, also better under previous regime, 36% versus 36% uh, of older. So it means that even those who didn't live under Saddam regime, they still feel that life under Saddam regime is better. This does not mean that they like Saddam regime because they didn't live under Saddam regime, but because they don't agree or they they feel unhappy with the current regime. Taking everything into account, do you feel things are better for you now under the present political system? Here we are. Uh, 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 asking or we are analyzing it according to, to the sect of the respondents. And as you can see it again, it's not only Sunnis who don't agree with current regime, as you can see it, it became more and more among Shias and Kurds who also uh, express more negative opinions towards current regime than uh, uh, it used to be 10 years or 15 years ago or even 20 years ago when it started. As you can see here, concerning Iraq, would you say that the entrance of co coalition forces was good or bad? 64%, almost two thirds of Iraqis say that it's bad. This is currently. Let us see or let us uh, uh, see it, how it was on 2003. Uh, on 2003, as you can see, Iraqis were divided, almost the same, 49% versus 49%. There was a clear split between Iraqis among uh, about the new uh, uh, regime and the new system. On 2004, the badness started to jump to 72%, and right now it is 64%. So, there was a good opportunity for the coalition on 2003 to invest in these opinions, but unfortunately this did not happen and there was a continuous decline in uh, uh, the positiveness of uh, uh, positiveness uh, views towards the uh, current regime, as you can see it very clear here. And this, again, this is not a special thing for uh, uh, young uh, or for old people. It's the same. It's the same. The same percentages based on whether male, female, or under 35 years or over 35 years. All of them have the same uh, uh, views and there is no differences between different segments, even among Shias, Kurds, or of course, for Kurds, the uh, it was good, seventy percent, but still, what what is very remarkable, and you can understand this started to emerge during the last five or six years, we have started noticing from all our polls that there is a pessimistic 
views among Kurds during emerging and evolving during the last five years, which should be a, a big red flag for Kurdistan regional government to, to watch it closely. So I think with this, I will stop my uh, presentation and I will leave it to Johnny because Johnny, I know that Johnny's slides are, will, will continue to tell the full story of what happened from 2003 till now. Thank you. Uh, Milka, thank you very much for that presentation. I have a number of questions as I'm sure uh, those in the audience will have, but I want to turn now to uh, to Johnny Held. Johnny, if you would please go ahead and give us your presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, and I assume you can all see the slide. Um, and thanks for inviting me. And thanks for having that talk from my friend uh, and mentor, I guess, in Iraq, uh, Dr. Munkith. I first met him in 2004 in a, a, a hotel in Amman. And um, uh, when we were working on behalf of the UK um, government in Iraq, and we've worked together ever since. Um, and we now, um, and the findings I'll show, take you through, are really taken from um, two sources. The one is the BBC poll that we just ran together uh, amongst 2,100 interviews. But also, um, I'm going to take some data from uh, an ongoing, the largest assessment uh, that's ever been uh, carried out in Iraq, ongoing assessment. Um, which is a product uh, we started um, uh, in 2014, 13, um, uh, called Pelican, which um, basically takes quantitative and qualitative opinion uh, throughout Iraq. Because it was, um, because of the time it was started, it was focused uh, more so on the Daesh areas, so uh, Anbar, Nineveh, um, Salahuddin, uh, Baghdad, but it's expanded out. So it's not truly nationally representative. It doesn't cover all 18 governorates, but it's a large sample size, uh, 3,000 now every month. Um, uh, and it's um, it has that ongoing uh, data trend. Um, so what I'll do quickly is I will uh, give you a couple of broad indicators. Then we'll have a quick look at act Iraqi attitudes towards democracy specifically, because, you know, we came to Iraq, we liberated Iraq, and then we very quickly started slapping up posters um, saying that we'll bring democracy to Iraq. So we'll try to better understand how Iraqis view democracy. Um, and then we'll look at um, Iraqi attitudes towards the uh, range host of foreign um, countries, partners, influences that, have, um, that are in Iraq. And um, I don't want it all to be doom and gloom. So hopefully I'll leave you with some, um, a couple of positive um, statements at the end. I've spent 20 years um, presenting data from Iraq with Munkith, and most of the time it's fairly depressing. It's fairly sad, but uh, I want to leave you on a, on, a, on, on a higher note. Anyhow, um, so if you just look, you know, question pollsters ask all around the world, uh, you know, America, Britain, everywhere, is do you think the country's going in the right direction or the wrong direction? And what that chart tells you very simply is you can see um, that the hope that everyone had uh, post-liberation um, has evaporated fairly quickly. You know, you had 62% in 2004 saying that things were going in the right direction. I mean, it was great, it was exciting, they're out in the streets, it was good. Um, uh, but fairly quickly and consistently, that has um, sunk. Um, the last measurement on this chart was taken in August 22. But even, in, even there, that shows you that opinion was almost as low as since records began. So although, and I'll show you in a minute, you see a little uplift every time you get a new prime minister in Iraq. Actually, relatively speaking, it was 22. It was almost as bad um, as the days pre you ambassador. Um, uh, 14%. Now, by way of comparison, in America today, you would get about 20% of people saying things were going in the right direction. And in Britain, you'd get about 16% of people saying, th saying things were going in the right direction. So it's not an anomaly globally, you know, it's not, it's not that frightening, but it's where it, where it was. I mean, it would have been 
I don't know the last time it was 62 percent in America or Britain, but I probably wasn't alive. But it's the transition in 20 years that that, that to some extent tells the story. Um, so on that, um, you can see here. So looking at this trend um, over time about whether or not they think that um, uh, what influence the government has on the internal affairs uh, events inside Iraq, um, you can see just going back to 2018 there. 74%, you know, it's down to like 50% now. So it's it, it, the um, perception towards the government's positive influence in Iraq, um, even though it's been going for 20 years, some sort of democracy for 20 years, um, has declined since 2018. And but what you can see here is, you look at the last three prime ministers that have been elected, you can see uh, an, a, an uptick every single time, but every single time, that uptick lasts for a few months and then it heads south pretty quickly. You can see it leveled off there with Academy after about three months. It's leveling off, beginning to level off possibly now with Sudani. You'd be a um, slightly crazy betting man if you thought that was continue, going to continue to rise. Who knows? But um, uh, certainly judged by recent history, um, this the, 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 the trend is repeating itself again now. Um, so let's get on to um, democracy and um, Iraqis uh, attitudes towards democracy. I leave you there with a quote um, from uh, a male respondent from a focus group um, uh, just at the end of last year. Um, if you look at it as a metric, um, on the whole, are you satisfied or dissatisfied with the way the democratic process is? Are developing in Iraq today. Again, a similar story. In, in 2005, only one in five were dissatisfied. Um, that goes against 63% of the population now who are dissatisfied with democracy. And you can see, like, there's things like you look at turnout in elections. You, you, you know, turnout. What was it last time? More than 30%. Like, I mean, it was, it was, or even lower. Um, oh. Very low. Yeah. Um, uh, so, um, uh, and if you look at it taken from the World Value Survey, so if you look at uh, the percentage of the population who say it's good to have a democratic political system, so globally, this is a survey that happens in multitude of countries around the world, happens sort of once uh, during each of these periods. So, it, so it's different times, but globally, you know, that's fairly consistent going back to 1995. Look at the drop there in Iraq and look at the relative drop compared in Iraq compared with the Middle East, the other countries in which the poll takes place in the Middle East um, is significantly lower. But then look at the doubling between 2014 and 2017 to 22, doubling the percentage you, pay, you say it's good to have a strong leader. And we'll look at some of the nostalgia around the Saddam uh, period among those who weren't even alive then um, that might help us better understand that. But again, 66%, it's significantly higher than anywhere else polled uh, in, the middle, in the Middle East. Um, so really, um, I mean, based off um, some quantitative data, but also a series of um, ongoing focus groups, um, the conclusion really is that Iraqis um, are struggling to detach the perception of what functional democracy is with their experiences experiences of it um so far they um kind of see it offering two key pillars um if you like um and one of those is definitely that the government um is able to provide for people it provides for all so whether it's electricity jobs education um rule of law etc um that's how they perceive um one of the sort of foundation pillars of of democracy and i mean ironically that is exactly what saddam was great at doing you know they'll say to you in focus groups you know even in the darkest days the electricity was never out or i always got bread or there was always something to eat you know so 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 what they what they're experiencing now often uh, in the struggles over the last few years um is very different to either what their parents had experienced or what they've read about in books under those Saddam days. Um, and in the focus groups, the second um, pillar or cornerstone of democracy is um, said to be freedom, 
you know, freedom of movement, freedom of expression, freedom of speech, etc. Um, and to them, that that's uh, respecting all tribes, all religions, all ethnicities, etc. But but with that also, there is a um, there are a number of concerns um, that are front of mind. So, for example, what about too much expression? So why should I? Why should someone come into a mosque not dressed appropriately? Or as you see now, um, some of our adversaries in the region are um, pushing quite heavily and dialing up um, LGBTQ plus coverage in the West because they, they know those issues don't play very well in the Middle East and, you know, and indeed in other parts of Africa. So um, although they see um, freedom as a core pillar of democracy, um, they certainly don't like to feel that freedoms are being pushed upon them, you know, which fair enough in a 20 year period is, it, you know, it's very difficult to get your heads around. Look at the way our attitudes towards homosexuality, look how long it took that, you know, those to change. Um, so um, it's a tricky relationship with democracy, um, which is why you, as Monk has just showed um, very smartly, why you see now um, there are majorities of people saying life is better now than it was under the uh, previous regime. Um, those who think that authoritarianism is good, and that includes young Iraqis who who um, who, who had never um, been around under Saddam, hear about, read about, are told about high levels of employment, better infrastructure, electricity, etc. Uh, under Saddam. Um, so for many not even born 20 years ago, there is still uh, a nostalgia. And they want someone to take control of their society um, to ensure their security and to rid Iraq of, of, of the negative influences and, and, and indeed uh, the militias and the upheaval that they faced over the last 20 years. Um, I think it's fair to say that they acknowledge that authoritarianism is also restrictive. I mean, clearly, if you go up and ask the Kurds about, you know, about it, you get a very different um, response or a, a slight, a, a different response to might you might get among potentially some of the Sunni population. But um, uh, they're aware that it was restrictive, but at least they were safe. Broadly, I mean, broadly, um, there was a there was a line, and and if you didn't cross the line. Um, I think broadly you'd have been okay. You certainly would have had electricity, you certainly would have had food, you probably would have had a job and some kind of money. Um, and on the bottom here, it's quite interesting, they kind of view um, Iraq and Saddam on this kind of uh, spectrum. So while there's no de debate that Daesh or um, Iranian uh, military groups are considered to be authoritarian, um, uh, Joe by President Biden, therefore by extension, the USA are not understood. You are not considered to be the perfect democracy, because, for example, they'll tell you that um, why is he banning Iraqis from coming to the country? Um, perceptions that you know America treats veiled women poorly, or um, he only won the election through fraud. Is a is a view you know a lot of people in in um, younger people in Baghdad will will push. So it's an interesting relationship um, with the two. But as the uh, gentleman there said in the focus group, under authoritarian regime affiliation won't matter anymore. It would be the rule of law. So you can see why that is attractive, and you can see why. Um, we found with the BBC poll some of those um, figures um, uh, and, 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 and um, people not necessarily loving now compared with, compared with those uh, days under Saddam. So, you know, as Monk has said, do you think things are better for you now um, or whether they're better for you under the uh, previous regime of Saddam? It's a clear, it's a clear jump in... 20 years and those experiences for example on democracy are, are are some of the things that are driving those perceptions um but let me get quickly on to 
international actors. So one of the questions we always ask is, um, do you think the following country is having a positive or negative um, influence on the events um, inside Iraq today? Um, clearly, when the ambassador took over, you had a higher 69%. Um, uh, something happened in the first year or something. <laughs> but but, but, but in, in all seriousness, um, I mean, the coalition, you know, as America, as, as the US has uh, withdrawn certainly from the streets, as it has now been run as a, a, an international coalition against Daesh, they're still considered to be the, um, amongst a third of the population, to still be having some kind of positive, positive influence. I think it's fair to say anyone who has an occupying force, certainly we saw this in Northern Ireland, um, in their countries, you don't, you don't want foreign boots on the ground um necessarily but you still have a third one one in three iraqis saying that the international coalition against Daesh still today has a positive influence on events in the country and you compare that you know as monkith said previously if you look at the yellow line you look at the iranian uh influence despite the control essentially they have not only over politics but also over media and therefore the ability to influence opinion, um, you see, you see um, remarkably low levels of the Iraqi population who consider Iran to be having a positive influence. One of the numbers clearly we're tracking quite closely um, globally, but also in Iraq, it, you know, is Russia, uh, you know, and, and also China, because if you put the two of them you put the previous slide and that slide together, you can see, I mean, China, for all their economic might, you know, are certainly within the margin of error, neck and neck with the international coalition in terms of having a positive influence on the internal affairs. Um, so final couple of slides. Because um, I've got to leave you with something positive to chew on. Um, so what is interesting is, um, despite everything that's happened over the 20 years, despite this perception that maybe um, life isn't better now than um, uh, it was previously, and, and, and that hope going, there is still an acceptance that the government of Iraq is not able to secure the country alone. So therefore, we do need to have some kind of coalition presence in Iraq. So NATO are there, obviously, training um, uh we, uh, there's a lot of training uh, and equipping and that kind of stuff ha that stuff happens. There's other, you know, maybe specialist forces operating in certain areas, but a majority, an overwhelming majority, two and three Iraqis would say, we can't do this alone. We need, we need your support. So um, although um, politically back at home, um, there are numbers of people who say that this is not a priority, there are other priorities in the world and that kind of stuff. The Iraqis are telling you very clearly there that they can't do this on their own. Um, and um, certainly if we withdraw, I think um, there are others who would be potentially willing to step in. Um, so if you look at um, here, who do you prefer? So although overall Iraqis have the more, most favourable opinion of China, clearly, like in many regions of the world, China is considered to be the preferred economic partner. Partner, when it comes to politics, and when it comes to security, there's really only one country they want to, um, they prefer. And in the middle there, you can see Iran doesn't win on any of those issues. Um, so, um, who do you want? to help you provide military support defend, to defend Iraq from foreign invasion. It is the US and it has always been the US. And to defeat uh, or to, to combat um, extremist organisations, it is and it has always been the US, despite um, others potentially trying to influence that. Uh, um, and then finally... Um, what about the youth and people willing to stay? So the good news is that um, despite all the um, experiences of democracy, despite uh, the challenges with Daesh, et cetera, um, you still have 64% of 
or yeah, 47% who say that they'll stay in Iraq and build a better country. So that hope hasn't been completely lost. Um, uh, and 17% uh, who say that they will stay but wish to worry less about the country and focus on themselves for a little bit. Um, so that's a quick snapshot view over a sort of grain of the data that we have. Johnny, thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, and I will again uh, solicit questions from our audience. I've got a number of friends and colleagues in the audience. So please uh, put in the Q&A function any questions you'd like to ask. Uh, Munkath, I'd like to start and ask you a question and maybe drill down a little bit more on what I saw as the biggest uh, outlier in your poll. And that is the, the generally larger satisfaction of Kurds with the American intervention and the system over the past 20 years. Um, I, I was trying to think about why this might be the case. I know that there was, uh, following uh, the you know, Saddam's invasion of Kuwait, there was the imposition of a no-fly zone in the north and some uh, Western military protection of the Kurdistan area. So there was kind of a 10-year head start of uh, sort of American and foreign military intervention in the north. Do you think this has any had any impact on uh, the way that Kurds see the invasion, or is it rather that the Kurds have been able to chart a more independent course under the uh, the new constitution of 2005, or are there other reasons? Yeah, I think it's a mixture of the two reasons that you, you just mentioned. First of all, uh, Kurds feel favorite for the uh, US intervention, uh, intervention 1991 with no fly zone areas and they were almost independent uh, area at, at that time and uh, also the, uh, the the constitution and the good leadership uh, of the government of the uh, Kurdistan made it made more hopes and more prosperities to to people uh, Erbil, Suleimania and Duhok uh, can be perceived as more developed uh, areas in comparison with Iraq less violence there yes there are violence there are some but in comparison with with other areas they enjoy a better life yet i can see that uh, as I've told you, that there are some red flags that should be uh, uh, took in consideration, uh, especially when it comes to corruption, uh, when it comes to bad governance. Uh, I can see uh, that these red flags, and especially when you compare between Suleimania opinions versus Erbil opinions. And I can see, I can say with a full confidence that uh, Suleimania views or attitudes are much more negative towards the government of Kurdistan than even some Arab areas, even, than, uh, even worse than some Arab areas. The, the Suleimania people feel so. Uh, here, uh, we were not able, or uh, I felt that it might be uh, uh, not uh, appropriate to uh, analyze opinions, current opinions, ac according to, to the governorate. Uh, but if we break down the numbers, we will see an evolving uh, unhappiness, uh, evolving concerns among Kurds as well, especially in uh, Suleimania. Uh, maybe uh, Munkath and perhaps Johnny with you as well. Uh, did you break down at all the uh, opinion polls on the desire to have a strong leader by region? In other words, did the Kurds measure similar uh, nostalgia for a strong leader as the Arabs did, or were they more or less supportive of a, a strong leader in Kurdistan? Yes, I analyze it uh, according to the, yes. In, uh, uh, still in Kurdistan, uh, though it's less than Arab areas, 
but still more than 50% of uh, uh, Kurds also, they, uh, they feel uh, this nostalgia uh, toward uh, a strong uh, leader. It's, uh, and there, there is also uh, another concern number uh, or worrying number uh, a different question which asked people about whether they prefer um, military or strong leader who don't care about parliament and uh, who don't care about parliament. And you have are almost around 70% of Iraqis who support having a strong leader or uh, military uh, people control the the government and i can say that nowadays if anything happened and uh, i would not like to see that day but if a military call or a strong leader take control of iraq then you will see iraqis in the streets welcoming this change that's why we are very open to any dictator right now. I think, and I think, I think that pattern's being repeated globally. You know, I mean, you saw in the World Value Survey, thirty-five percent preferring a strong leader, up to forty-four percent. That's globally. You know, we've all had our experiences, President Bush, Prime Minister Johnson, of strong leaders. But um, uh, you look at the coup season going on in Africa, right? I mean, look at Sudan today. Look at Mali, look at Burkina Faso, look at Central African Republic. You know, there is, they've had more coups in the last couple of years than they had for the previous 20 or when I was a kid, it was coup season. That kind of coups went away. There's been a huge um, increase in um, military coups um, around the world. So, yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if you had that in, in, in Iraq. Um, people would be out on the streets. And, and Johnny, I want to dig down a little deeper on some of your uh, poll data as well. I think mostly from the, the Pelican polling. And while I would like to think that my presence in Baghdad was the reason for the high opinion of the United States in the middle of 2017, I think it had a lot more to do with the recent defeat of Daesh and the perception that the international coalition and the U.S. military had played a significant role in, in the defeat of Daesh. Um, maybe the... Uh, this is, this is my question. To what do you attribute uh, the ups and downs of public opinion polling with the United States as opposed to the relatively flat lines for China, for Russia, for Iran in the polling that you've done? Is there a reason that uh, the international coalition, American and European uh, opinions have been fluctuating more than these other, uh, these other countries, particularly Iran, which seems to have been uh, pretty consistently negative. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, um, I mean, the US and uh, the international forces were there to liberate uh, I Iraq. I, I would say that Iran necessarily was there to liberate Iraq from any, uh, uh, of anything. I mean, um, uh, 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 Iran's intentions um, and, and, and the control they have over power uh, and, 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 and the mess with politics and 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 the inability to form solid governments um, has seen them track so so low. And what's interesting about the Iranian number is actually the Shias, who are the most uh, have shown the biggest decline in support towards Iran. I mean, you can understand it with the Sunnis a bit, maybe, but it's the Shias that have gone south. But um, I think um, people. Um, uh, if you live in um, a conflict area for um, however many years, uh, you can see who they prefer to be the, the, the security partner. You have the firepower and the number of people. I think, yes, it has fluctuated, but you still remained higher than the other main um, superpowers uh, in the region. I don't know what you think, if, whether you have a different angle on that. Maybe not. Well, let me ask another question to the two of you. Um, I, I, 
the Pelican polling basic, basically focused, uh, Johnny, on foreign actors, not uh, sort of domestic actors tied to a foreign country. Um, I remember at that time when the United States was riding high in public opinion polling when I was there, so was the opinion of the counterterrorism service, of the Iraqi army, um, and the popular mobilization forces, even though they remain very politically tied to Iran and got a lot of Iranian support. So I know it's not in the polling, but can either of you address whether or not opinions of the popular mobilization forces, the political parties associated with them, or generally uh, a pro-Iran or pro uh, uh groups in Iraq have changed this significantly over the same periods? Uh, yes, uh, here uh, the we should differentiate, or Iraqis differentiate between the PMF uh, and the population uh, forces and the Iranian supported militias. So Iraqis for Iraqis, the PMF is part of the uh, of the Iraqi government or military uh, forces and it is a formal uh, forces and it is established based on al-sistani uh, fatwa so for them uh, the perceptions toward or the attitudes toward the PMF is still very high though it declined but not very much it declined but the uh, feelings or the attitudes towards the militias or the parties related to these militias are very negative so uh, if if you ask about the pmf to iraqis in general the support is almost between 60 to 70 percent uh, among iraqis uh, but if you ask about any militia or any party related to any militia without a specific name you will always have something between 10 to 20 percent only support even among shias so uh, there is a different uh, attitude uh, toward uh, both entities i would only i would only say um so we do track sentiment towards the PMF and towards the CTS. Um, so, um, I mean, the Iraqi army historically have always been considered to be strong, um, well-educated. Um, although um, for the people historically, quantitatively, um, used to say that the Iraq, they, had, they, they were favorable and had faith in the Iraqi police. Qualitatively, you'd hear something very, very different under the influence of Iranians, liars, cheats, et cetera, et cetera. But in terms of the PMF, um, it's about three and five who think that the PMF are strong. And, and, and that's as much in like Nineveh and places like that, you know, Sunni heartlands. Um, uh, it's uh, more people, about 75% of people think the CTS is strong. Uh, and that compares with the government of Iraq, which is about 35%. So you can see, you know, I mean, you've got two institutions there that are tracking double the government um, perceived to be strong. Uh, I, I will uh, throw in an observation. We have a question from uh, Rashid al-Islam, who joined us a bit late uh, from Bangladesh. Uh, for those of you who may have missed uh, the initial presentation that uh, Dr. Munkith made, if you will send an email to info at agsiw.org, um, we will send you a copy of Dr. Munkith's uh, uh, polling results. Uh, it does show surprising unanimity, however, among uh, different ethnic groups, among different age groups, and among genders, with the one outlier that I asked about being uh, significantly different results from Iraqi Kurds. But again, we can we can send you the results of that polling if you will send us a uh, 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 an email to info at agsaw.org. Uh, also, this uh, presentation will be is being recorded and should be up on our website uh, by tomorrow. So if you want to go back and hear the first part, Dr. Mulke's presentation and, and Johnny Hill's presentation, you can do that as well. Uh, 
we are down to about five minutes left. And I'm afraid I, I want to ask a, a maybe a counterintuitive question to each of you. Uh, the, the real question is, does public opinion polling matter in Iraq in terms of government policy, the way that the government deals with the population, provision of services, or even the way that it conducts foreign relations? Um, in the democracies of the West, uh, especially the United States and Europe, there is a lot of public opinion polling to help uh, political parties guide their uh, campaigns to try to figure out what issues are more or less important for the population as they run electoral campaigns. Um, in your experience, Dr. Munkhaith, how do, do governments of Iraq and how do uh, institutions in Iraq use this idea of public opinion polling and does it really have an impact on policy either in the private sector or government sector? Yeah, thank you for this question, Mr. Ambassador, because uh, Iraqis in general, I mean, not Iraq, I mean, the government of Iraq, the politicians in, in Iraq, they don't care very much about the public opinion unless uh, as in other countries, uh, it is the election uh, period or the election uh, seasons. Uh, unfortunately, uh, for me, one of the big mistakes of United States is to make made it very easy for Iraqi politician to uh, understand uh, or to provide them with data about Iraqi perceptions, Iraqi attitudes. I mean, the the formula was always like that. You have big American institutions like IRI, NDI, uh, different institutions conduct big uh, uh, surveys and then provide the data, go to uh, Iraqi politicians to educate them about public opinion. So why they bother themselves? They already have the uh, the the data and with the uh, uh, old dictator trend uh, among Iraqi politicians that they think that they knows better than Iraqis they knows better than their people so why they uh, they have to use the data about public opinion but during last uh, couple of months it's it was astonishing to me to be approached by a couple of Iraqi institutions for the first time after 20 years to conduct polls for them. This is a significant change. And I think the uh, uh, wide coverage of international media outlets to Iraqis uh, uh, public opinion made these politicians eventually think that it is better for them to to understand Iraqi uh, uh, Iraqis' attitudes. But in general, till now, after twenty years, I have not been approached by any Iraqi politician or party or institution to conduct any poll for them, unfortunately. I would only say that, um, um, listen, so 70 years ago, 60 years ago, something Dr. George Gallup said, that if democracy is the will of the people, someone should go out and measure it, right? So you need opinion polling to better understand public perceptions. Um, the Middle East is littered with cases, Mubarak, Ben Ali, um, Abdul Saleh, who ignored public opinion. He was literally forbidden in Egypt to ask the approval rating of Mubarak. You can argue he had no idea exactly how much resentment there was to him and his regime, and then it all kind of toppled. I think so, So um, you'd be, it's a dangerous game to ignore public um, opinion. Um, and then also clearly, um, you'll know Ambassador, you know, when you were in Iraq, there were a lot of influence operations that were ha that were going around. There was a lot of you probably had adverts following you around TV channels all over the place every time you turned on. Um, you know, you need to, to to measure the influence, the impact, the effect of those campaigns that you're using, whether it be to unite Iraqis and say to them that we're all one, we're Iraqis, we're not Sunnis or Shias, or whether it's to promote democracy or whatever it is, or undermine the Daesh or whatever it is. 
you need um, public opinion also to um, measure the effectiveness of of your campaign and, and you know and therefore your taxpayer dollar. Well, I'm afraid we've run out of time for our session. I, I wanted to add uh, one final comment from myself uh, based on some of uh, uh, the Pelican polling data. I found it very interesting that as uh, Adel Abdel Mahdi, Mustafa Kadami, and Mohammed Shia Sudani were chosen as prime minister, there was uh, an increase in support for democracy in the system. I'm hoping that this shows that there is still, at least among Iraqi youth, uh, hope for the future. The fact that uh, young Iraqis, a majority of them seem to want to stay in Iraq and make a better life in a better country also gives me a little bit of hope. Uh, thank you, Johnny. Thank you, Mukith, for doing this for us, for giving us a very interesting historical view of public opinion. And for me, at least a little bit of optimism that the future uh, does hold better things for Iraqis and especially for young Iraqis. For those of you in the audience, thank you very much for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you again for other ADSIW programs in the future. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening.